Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's town hall with Corey. Uh, Corey is here as our one of our acupuncturists here at CAH and master healer and breathwork master and uh, a lot of other things, woodworker, a buddy of mine too. Awesome. So, uh, so we're talking today about about acupuncture and breathwork, and um, we'll start a little bit with COVID. 19 uh, updates as usual and then what we're going to kind of dive into that so i'm going to get started sorry a little late today welcome everyone thank you for attending today so just a little joke for people that are working or, or have ever worked in their life so my boss told me to have a good day so i went home so now we're all teleworking at home a lot um and then this is our tribe page if you want to check it out it's it's a facebook group it's open to to patients, it's open to community members, practitioners. We have, share a lot of good health and wellness information. There's even a couple of jokes on there, uh, one of which I think I took for today's uh, presentation. But it's really a fun time there. Um, in terms of the office, so just to talk again a little bit about COVID, um, Montgomery County is entering phase two on Friday at 5 p.m. and that the numbers continue to go down, but we know that there's still high risk groups. And we wanna, we wanna I've, I've had some people ask about how to proceed in phase two, how to, you know, should people go out now, you know, um, things like that. That is still individualized. There are some high risk groups that, which I listed here. Should still proceed with caution, but can enter phase two and that, you know, social distancing orders are still in effect. So uh, wear, your, wear your masks, you know, or have, you have the designer ones, you can't buy mine, you know cloth mask, you know, something like that. Um, so please do that. And then um, we did, we do finally have pulse ox machines. I think we're waiting for a long time from them because they have to get shipped to us. And uh, so if anyone's interested, please contact our wellness coordinator, Trisetta Hull. You can email her through Charm if you are in need of one. And then I wanted to go through a little bit on research updates for dexamethasone and vitamin C now now a lot of the a lot of the research has been like the wild west that's why I put that in here in terms of kind of we're trying different treatments nothing's necessarily sticking um, we're going to we're going to actually do one question first let's see can you do that Jen or do I do that uh, so have you been we're just curious uh, now that we're kind of opening opening back up and you know we're gonna um everyone's kind of opening things back up just curious if you've been back to the office yet or not or if you have an appointment coming up and for those who of you who have been back um you know that you know we we're pretty much doing social distancing and you know wearing masks and all the all the usual ppe kind of equipment so it, it does have a different feel than than you know had before um i think it will be that way for a while so uh, a few people have come in, um, and then some. So about half of people have either have an appointment coming up or been back. For those who haven't, I know hopefully you've been using telehealth, you've been using Zoom as a way. Um, at, at this point, I think you know you have to kind of evaluate your individual situation in a in a um, individualized way. Um, so you know, but but you know, health and wellness don't stop, and you know, I think we're going to start to open up a lot more things now in July. So um, this is something from Michigan, which you probably have seen on Facebook, uh, but experts rank riskiest places related to COVID-19. So these are ID docs and public health experts. So you can see that the riskiest places are considered places that are indoors, that are having high proximity to others where they may have a least likelihood of compliance with, with wearing masks. They have more exposure times to bars, music, concerts, and sports stadiums. Other places, kind of, you can see here buffets, you know, casinos, um, things like that. Um, interestingly, house, house parties that are indoors were only a five, probably because there's not as many people in the in the house parties. Um, and then dentists were down here at four. Doctors' office waiting rooms, which is kind of our thing. Now we we don't even have a waiting room now. You know, we have a waiting room, but no one's sitting in there. In the, essentially, we try to get people to the lab, get people to their treatment rooms. So that that's kind of been eliminated. So that risk goes down a lot with that. Getting groceries was at, was at a three. Um, 
And then walking, running, biking on trails, like really getting outside is pretty minimal risk. Pumping on, at the gas station is a minimal risk. Takeout is the lowest risk there. This is risk in stadium. Uh, and uh, this would be a low risk uh, right now and possibly also in the future if the fan base is not that great. So that's a, just a <laughs> little joke there. <laughs> uh, so this could be one. Um, and then and here's another, this is another funny picture from I think South Korea. And uh, because they're doing kind of, uh, they're still playing baseball there apparently, but they, they line the stadium with, with stuffed animals. You see SpongeBob right there and some other stuff. That's pretty cool. Um, and this is our office. So this is our office in the waiting room. Literally no one's sitting out here usually, but there's some chairs in case. Um, people are usually just going back to the, um, the thank you for taking these pictures. Uh, who, whoever did that, I think Christine and the team did that. So thank you. Thanks, Jen, for putting that together. So still looks beautiful, still looks nice, just not many people in it. A lot of people are on Zoom right now. People are in, in the treatment rooms getting physicals and getting acupuncture, but they're not in the waiting room. So in COVID-19, there was a study on dexamethasone, which is a steroid, and they just announced this but didn't publish the details yet. But they found that in severely ill patients that both were on oxygen and on a ventilator, that that actually saved their lives, that it, the outcomes were improved. So literally with a, a mortality rate of 90% or higher uh, right now, even with the best treatments, this is a game changer. So we're going to see the details on that. But we know that dexamethasone as a steroid reduces inflammation. And we know from a functional medicine perspective that COVID-19 is a disease of inflammation, that it affects and inflames the lungs, the heart, the kidney, liver, blood vessels causing blood clots and brain inflammation causing dizziness, headache, and brain fog. So all these things, so we have to think about COVID as really a disease of inflammation. We also have to see who's really behind coronavirus, which is actually Charmin, which you can kind of see that there <laughs> to get more more uh, sales, I think, on the, paper, on the uh, toilet paper. But, but from a functional medicine perspective, we want to decrease inflammation we do that through lifestyle, we do that through nutrition, we do that through treatments like acupuncture, we do that through uh, measured and moderate activity and, and some vitamins. We also know that there's some research to other ways to help with balancing the system out, optimizing vitamin D levels, balancing blood sugar, vitamin C to help reduce oxidation of iron, and focusing on what I call immune system strength, balance, and flexibility, kind of like this elephant here. So we're gonna do another group visit, which is also focused on gut health, which is actually also an immune class, I would say, because 80% of your immune system is in your gut. So Katie Mora, our lead functional nutritionist, and myself are doing a talk, a group class virtually that is built to insurance on Zoom. It's Tuesday from uh, June, uh, June 30th, uh, rather, from 12 noon to 1.30 p.m. So if you're interested in that, please, email Wendell, Waffer, and Charm. I expect that class to fill up and we'll probably have a second class as well, but that'll be the first class here um, to express interest. This, this should say gut class, but interest in the gut um, visit, please email Wendell about that, about this optimizing gut health. Love to see you there. And then this is more of an update. And then send it for Corey here. So, so acupuncture, uh, both Corey and Liz are seeing patients. Uh, Nick is seeing patients and is doing uh, brain scans and neurofeedback. Tony started with health coaching and she's available five days a week. And for those of you who have seen her uh, and have you know done some of these wellness treatments, love for you to kind of pop up in the chat box and you know let let other people know what what you've thought of um, you know how you know your healing there. She's really been amazing as well. Uh, Laura and Meg have been doing IV nutrition therapy, really helping to boost people's immune system. That's been very helpful for people. We have labs open, medicine is open, uh, mental health care and naturopathic medicine, Dr. Diane and, and Dr. Amina and Mark Davis, they're all, they're all on telehealth. Carrie will start back likely next month. It's not official yet, but we're gonna, we, she's gonna reopen uh, this summer. We are looking for a second licensed massage therapist for our clinic. And so if anyone knows any, anyone there, that, that would be helpful. And then we're, Dr. Hees is doing physical therapy and it's been amazing also, and it's been really helping a lot of patients uh, also there. I think there's one more that I can't see because I don't know why I can't see that. What does it say above that? Oh, nutrition, of course. So Katie and Jen are, are doing nutrition and really helping a lot of people. We know that nutrition is, is really key for immune system health and just overall health as well. So they're continuing on telehealth um, as well. 
So we are also going to be starting in the next couple of weeks, hopefully, allergy shots. I know some of you have been, you know, wanting that or, you know, looking for that. So that we'll make an announcement very soon about that. Help, And we are still accepting new patients in the tri-state area. And you can learn more by calling uh, Gina Washington here at her number here, 301-602-2372. That's a direct number to Gina. That's not our main number. So that'll get you right in there if you know friends and family. Uh, we can see people on Zoom. We're able to do that right now um, via new patients. And you can go to our website as well and learn more. So another polling question, and, and this is something that's really been a game changer for me personally, is you know uh, doing acupuncture uh, myself, um, learning about it, uh, and then uh, and then experiencing it also. And, and this has been you know an amazing journey for me to to start with with acupuncture and integrative health. And um, so just curious, who's had acupuncture either here or elsewhere in our clinic, but also outside of here? To uh, have you had that before is the question. Good to see everyone here. I'm sc scrolling through the list here. Thank you for attending. So, wow, that's amazing. So, uh, so I don't, so first of all, I don't want that one person to feel left out that, that voted no. Um, it's great. If you're afraid of needles, you can always do acupressure, which we can also talk about today if you'd like. But uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. 96% of respondents have had acupuncture before, which shows how, how versatile acupuncture is. It can be used for so many different conditions, immune system health, gut health. It can be used for hormone health help with stress and anxiety, you know, just so many things. It can really be a game changer. So, um, so yeah, so a lot of people are veterans here. Um, people may not know that back in the uh, Paleolithic times, the woolly mammoth actually loved acupuncture too, because they tried to, you know, eat the woolly mammoth, but then they are actually helping the, the mammoth's neck pain there with some, uh, some bladder 60 points. So some early acupuncture there and helping the, helping the person, the uh, animal's neck there. <laughs> um, Okay, and then this is acupuncture. And nowadays, single-use sterile needles, um, professional training programs that Corey's gone through and Liz has gone through. And here's Liz and Corey, or Corey and Liz rather, in their PPE gear here at the clinic saying hi. Now, acupuncture is a type of health and healing care that is at least 2,000 years old. And, and it's been popular in the US since at least the 1970s because Richard Nixon went over to China during that time and kind of brought that back and it was publicized, I think, in the New York Times. And that kind of got it more uh, entrenched here. But you know, acupuncture works with the body instead of against the body to strengthen and balance the immune system and to strengthen and balance the overall wellness. So some of the benefits of acupuncture include to reduce stress and inflammation and also relieve pain, especially back pain, knee pain like osteoarthritis, headaches, things like that, muscle pain in general. Um, what else? Um, IT band, you know, a lot of different things like that. Um, improving mood, you know, it reduces cortisol. Um, it also improves dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, which is going to help improve mood, basically. It improves energy by increasing ATP production from the mitochondria. It helps digestive conditions. It helps allergies. And it also lightens the spirit and optimizes wellness. So it does all these things, which is why it's so versatile, which is why 96% of you have, have tried it already. Um, so just turning over to Corey here, like turn over to Corey, our acupuncturist that's on town hall today. So thank you so much for, uh, for being on here, Corey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Are you going to do the, the poll at all for, uh, for, for me, Jen, well, before I take over the, uh, the slides here? Do we wanna do sure. That? Yeah. Um, Dr. Wong, if you want to switch your share to Corey, so just stop sharing and then let Got him. It. But while that happens, I'll pull this up. So here's a poll for you. Yeah, and so this is, um, um, Dr. Wong is talking a lot about acupuncture and, um, you know, love to see anyone who's interested in, um, in receiving acupuncture, either uh, Liz Bear or myself, um, are, are great for a multitude of conditions. And um, as Dr. Wong was explaining, and, you know, during the COVID sort of times, um, now that we've re reopened, you know, I'm seeing people that that really need treatment or in a risk group that um, that is acceptable to sort of uh, come in with that sort of thing. But I, you know, really thinking of what I can deliver here on a um, 
you know, remotely on a Zoom call, I've sort of lent more towards our, uh, a breathing practice. So, um, you know, I get a lot of people that I talk to about meditation and um, yeah, so it looks like you do have um, uh, about a quarter of people have uh, tried to meditation, uh, a few people breathing and uh, uh, great. Okay, um, so this just helps me know where I'm starting at. I talk to a lot of people about meditation in my clinic and you know, there's, it's pretty much universally accepted that meditation would be good to you, but most of what I hear from patients is oh, I tried it and I'm not good at it and so therefore I can't do it. Um, and I think there's an expectation that sort of your mind needs to reach some you know, Xanadu place of complete blank screen uh, for it to be effective or for you to be good at it and, and really don't accept themselves as becoming a beginner and learning how to completely cultivate a different set of a mindset altogether and, and that, that does take time. And so um, through my own practice, um, you know, I've, I've been practicing a breathing exercise most days of the week, seven days a week, some I, I'd probably say uh, uh, on average about six days a week for about 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, I've been doing that for about a year and a half and really say that that it has been a, been a very uh, large change in my life that's been brought on uh, by this breathing technique. And I'll go over the ones that I, the one that I do um, today, basically wanted to introduce a breathing practice because I think as an, as an alternative to meditation, it can be a little bit more of an active uh, experience, feel like you're doing a little bit more for yourself than trying to just stay put and be blank mind, you know, that sort of stuff, which isn't really what meditation is. But for our uh, experience today, um, just gonna go to in, and explore something that you should be able to do kind of self-help at home and take on one of these practices and really be um, helpful with different emotional, experiences that you've had. I know this has been really challenging on a lot of people. And just to give you an extra sort of tool in your toolkit, if it appeals to you, you know, I think you should be able to start some sort of form of practice here um, with this uh, uh, presentation. So let me go through, I'm gonna sort of share my screen here and then go into this. Give me a second, here we go. And the full screen with that. And then, um, do, do, one second here. All right. So, thanks for the patience there. Um, so, my uh, the outline for today's practice is, you know, how breath work can be useful for as to you as a self help resource, um, and give you uh, four different breath work exercises that you can practice at home. Um, the exercises that we're going to be reviewing and and doing one of these experiences. Um, are all geared towards relaxation and helping you with emotional sort of uh, stickiness, uh, so to speak. And um, then we'll, so we'll do a practice at the end. It's a five minute practice, sort of put it at the end. If it's something that you wanna participate in, great, it's five minutes. If you can do a portion or all of it, then, then that's fine. And then, you know, if you do decide to uh, um, not participate, all you'd be missing out really is uh, resources where you can find out more information. Um, so. Uh, and then, you know, just a little disclaimer here to, to please practice this safely. If you're going to take this off and do it yourself, you know, sitting up is, is okay. Laying down is preferable. If you were to ever get sort of lightheaded or anything, we just don't want you falling down. You know, don't practice it around water or in a bathtub or anything just obnoxious like that. But I hope you wouldn't. But, uh, you know, and then the main thing is listen to your body. You know, if your body's responding because you're doing something, I mean, it might be okay to push through some little things, but if it starts to signal, you know, you know when you're, you reach a danger mode and just be attentive to that and sort of, um, yeah, be nice and safe with yourself uh, is, the, is the thing. So, Basically what we're doing with uh, breath work is, um, like I was saying, it's a little bit more, more active than a meditation. You're doing something, it's a, you could think of it as an exercise. Um, with the breath, it's a very interesting physiological uh, component of ourselves where we are able to uh, have it under autonomous control. So it will breathe for us and the body will breathe itself. We don't have to do anything about it. And we can also take it over and do it ourselves and sort of, so it's like these, these modern cars where most cars are, are automatic transmission nowadays, but down at the bottom, you, you can slide the shifter over and then be able to kind of manually go up or down a gear. Um, you know, so if you're driving down a hill, the car would take it over, it'd let you drive, you know, whatever the car would, but you could also downshift it and sort of slow the car down with the engine by downshifting a gear. So that's 
kind of what we're, we're intending to do with the breath. We're kind of going to take it over into manual control and do something deliberate with it to create an effect on our cells. And so the way that this all works is that each physical state that, that we're in has a different um, breathing pattern associated with it. So, um, you know, if you're getting ready to bungee jump or uh, something exciting, you've got a different breathing pattern than if you would be relaxing after a meal. Or if you're having a different emotional state, if you were angry or agitated, or stressed out, those are different sort of breathing states that may be shallower and maybe shorter durations and these sorts of things, which would be different than if you were in a sort of joyful state or a loving state. Those would maybe be deeper and more full breaths and these sorts of things. So knowing that we have each state has its own breathing pattern, it's basically, uh, you know, I think the word hack is very hacky, but um, it's basically what we're doing is we're, we're going to emulate the breath of that state and then create the physical physiological state in reverse. So that's basically what all these different practices do is emulate the state with the breath and then the physiology changes to emulate that state. So it's, um, it's just working backwards and it's really effective. So we're going to go through sort of which different breathing um, strategies create what different states in the body. And so um, this is my way of thinking about it. I don't know if I've read this anywhere or, or just sort of my own thing here, but um, Exhales, I consider is sort of the brakes on the nervous system. It slows it down and relaxes it. And inhales are the gas pedal and you can activate the nervous system and become ready and sort of able for a challenge, you know, if you were to increase the breathing and sort of mimic that sort of thing. There's a lot of different techniques that have breath holding in them, so hypoventilation. And there's a lot of really interesting uh, research around this. Um, you would think that, you know, deep breathing is the way to go, but there's also a lot of work on, you know, working with your um, CO2 levels because they vasodilate, which opens up the blood vessels and can increase blood carrying capacity to all sorts of organs and in your brain and that sort of thing. And it can be very, very helpful with asthma and different ways to sort of work with the CO2 levels in a different way, because it is, um, most people think that they need oxygen as the trigger to breathe when it's actually building up the CO2 levels as those start to rise. That's what triggers your, your need to breathe. So most often you're, you're carrying enough oxygen. You know, if you go get your pulse ox read at our clinic, when you come in for a visit, you're going to see that you're at like 98, 99% and that's normal. You've got very good oxygen carrying capacity. It's when the CO2 starts to build up that you're going to need to sort of take a breath. So working with that level and so you can sort of you know, build up your tolerance of CO2 uh, and then work with it in ways to dilate blood vessels and help with your, your cardiovascular health and health in that way. Um, so that's interesting strategy. Um, and then, you know, do you breathe through your nose or mouth? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, you do both. And, you know, your, your nose is built for the function. It's designed with a lot of really cool mechanisms in it to uh, condition the air. It's the air conditioning mechanism. Um, so it warms the air, it moistens the air, it removes, you know, through these really cool turbinates sort of um, uh, agitates the air to drop the particles out. Uh, and so gets a cleaner, more, more conditioned air to reach into your lungs so that less work has to be done, you know, downstream with cleaning out your lungs if, within your lungs. Uh, but you can, you know, get more oxygen through your mouth typically. Um, and so you can alternate between the two to create different sort of states in yourself. You know, it's sort of whatever you're comfortable with. Some people are more inclined to be, you know, breathe through their mouth or if you have some sort of condition or extra sinus uh, pressure or something, you know, you might be more inclined to breathe through your mouth. Totally fine. I'm not going to recommend one way or another in any of these exercises. You do what you're comfortable with. And there are some exercises that build up your ability to breathe through your nose more consistently and start to do small bits of exercise with just nose breathing. Um, and so it can be a healthy shift to have air that's a little bit more conditioned and, and prepared for your lungs. So, and then a little bit of anatomy here, um, just to help you cognitively with uh, understanding what we're doing here is, is, you know, the diaphragmatic breathing or what some people call belly breathing. So if you look at the, um, 
at the at the photos here at the bottom of the screen, you've got this large diaphragm uh, muscle that goes underneath as like a tent underneath both of your um, uh, underneath your lungs, underneath your rib cage, and it is a big dome shaped muscle. And when it contracts, it flattens downward to become flat, and so it pulls basically creates as it as it contracts creates a vacuum and the muscle sort of flattens out creates a void where it was and pulls air into that negative space and so it's the main breathing muscle it's sort of we have a lot of other muscles that can sort of auxiliary muscles around the rib cage the intercostals around the, the, the clavicles that can help and open up the rib cage even more so that we can get more breath in, but um, typically we want to concentrate more on the largest muscle that, that we use for breathing. So that's why we call it belly breathing. You know, it's literally as it moves down, it pushes organs and things, they have to go somewhere. So you tend to have your stomach sort of um, move out. And so a good way to know if you're belly breathing is to simply put your hand on your belly. You have to have somewhere for your organs to go. So as they come out, you know that your diaphragm is coming down. And so to really focus into that area while you're breathing by putting your hand there and that sort of just signals your consciousness to sort of focus on using the diaphragm for your main mode of breathing. It can, you know, we can fall into a very shallow breathing and if we're stressed or if we're under tension in some way, we can start to use more auxiliary muscles and start to breathe with our upper chest and it works. Um, it's a little bit more, it, it emulates a sign of, of more distressed and trying to, um, uh, you know, get extra air in. So if the diaphragm isn't, isn't working enough, you add in these extra breaths. And so a situation like that, if we're running from the tiger or something, we don't just diaphragmatic breathe, uh, we, we pull in all these auxiliary muscles. So when you're sitting around, hunched over your computer, stressed out about an email, and you're using these auxiliary muscles, it further sort of emulates that condition, which tells your psychology, it tells your physiology that, hey, you know, we are in a stressed state. So it can really, it's um, the mechanism um, on how the diaphragmatic breathing um, works. It, it helps us to calm down. And it's a very complicated mechanism where when you breathe through your diaphragm, it signals a state of relaxation um, through activation of the vagus nerve, but it tells the parasympathetic nerve parasympathetic nervous system that everything is calm and everything's relaxed we can breathe normal and so it really turns off the the fight or flight mechanism whereas these auxiliary muscles really activate the fight or flight or or, or keep it going because they're the ones that add in all that extra oxygen so hopefully that helps you understand sort of the basis of where we're going here um, there's a bunch of different types of breath work you know it's sort of do you want to prepare for exercise and have more cardiovascular sort of um, stamina and energy do you want to relax and calm yourself so those are sort of the big um, bifurcation of, of breathing types but then there's the breathing strategies for different types of diseases um, asthma there's a lot of this co2 work uh, was by constantine buteco um, different cardiovascular diseases, heart rhythms, all sorts of different things that you can help with. Uh, a lot of people use breathing to sleep. It's a really reg re helps regulate your nervous system. So if you're activated, like we said, we can calm ourselves down through the breath. The nervous system gets the message and also emulates that and can help you sort of uh, fall asleep. Like I said, it can stimulate energy. Um, it can help with mental focus and clarity. And I'll talk more about my experience of that when we get to the breathing type that I've been doing. Um, and then immunity. Um, they have found that you can affect your immune system through breath work. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then um, emotional regulation. You know, if you're in a calm and relaxed state, you know, sticky emotions are sometimes less sticky, these sorts of things. So, you know, during our COVID experience, if we need some, some help to calm ourselves down or we're watching some news or something, we need to retreat and help our nervous system calm down. This can be a really great strategy for them. So, um, when to perform these, these breathing exercises, um, I like to think of them as transitions in your day. So if you're going to wake up in from sleep into wake, there's a great transition time from, um, you know, uh, before a meal or before one activity into another. So if you're gonna, hey, I've been working all day and I'm gonna go sit in my car to go home, do a little breathing exercise before I start to drive home and really separate those moments in your day 
and wherever there's a transition or from wake into sleep, those sorts of things. So you can do them multiple times throughout the day, uh, but really uh, uh, highlighting the, the, time, the transitions or whatever fits in your schedule. You know, the best time to uh, do it is the time that you will do it. Um, so however it works in your schedule, and most of these take, you know, 15 minutes or 20 minutes and whatever they say about meditation is uh, if you don't have 15 minutes to meditate, uh, you should be doing it for 45 minutes kind of thing. So, um, so we're going to go through these four types. I've selected these for their ability to relax you and help with emotional sort of stimulation that we've all been, uh, I'm assuming that we've all been through some, some shape or form of with our major life transitions that we've had. So um, start with our uh, to first technique, we're going to go through four of these. So we're going to do, um, uh, start with box breathing here. It's a very easy, very, uh, very easy to do in the moment. You can be doing this. You could be standing up. It's that simple. You could be sitting down, uh, ideally, or, or even laying down, but a lot of, uh, first responders or, uh, military, this is very, um, uh, used a lot in those communities where they need, they have a stressful situation, they need to recenter themselves and keep going. Uh, and so they need to kind of have this duality of a relaxed and calm state with an activated ready to go state. And so if you're in a stressful situation like uh, public speaking, or you're going to go talk to someone, you know, and have a, a you know, emotionally charged uh, conversation or something like this, you can do just a few of these and it relaxes you yet keeps you ready and sort of on point to be able to, to do your task. So really easy to do. Um, you think of it like a box because all the, all the sides are equal. Um, so you inhale for four seconds, you hold for four seconds, exhale for four seconds and hold for four seconds. So it's just a, a uh, inhale and an exhale with the hold at the top and bottom. So you sort of just count with your breath and do a, you know, a gentle count. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, YouTube videos and I'll show you the link to that at the end, but uh, there's a lot of different resources where you can find a timer to do this. There's a lot of different breathing apps. And so if you wanted to do that on a regular basis, I tend to like to use a timer because I don't want to sit and keep track, but you're basically doing equal counts uh, through all these. And once you get the rhythm sort of set, it's really easy to just you know, perpetuate that rhythm. Um, so like I said, benefits are an immediate sense of calm, uh, improved stress response and emotional regula regulation and keeping your, your mental state sort of focused and, and ready and clear. And so that was our first technique. Um, our second one has been getting pretty popular. Um, I've had a lot of patients that came in talking about this and it tended to be a little bit outside of my realm of interest just because it seemed a bit extreme um, for the techniques that I tend to do. But I had enough people coming in and I started the technique. I've been doing it for about a year and a half. And after I did the fir first two sessions, I was completely hooked and then did about five or six, uh, basically a week later, I was like, wow, this is going to definitely be a part of my life. And really what I noticed, because I thought, oh, I'll get some, you know, cardiovascular improvement, you know, maybe a please sort of respiration during my exercise or, or something like that. That was my uh, sort of intention going into it. And I don't know if that's happened or not. That's really hard for me to measure, but we're really just sort of night and day um, experience was my, my mental clarity and my focus and my word recall and looking for words that sort of, you know, may not come, but just my ability to sort of stay on top of what I want to speak next without really thinking about it, literally just, came online, I felt like my, my brain and body just became, must have been dehydrated or, or under oxygenated in some way that I really didn't realize that once the, the improvement that this brought to my brain and sort of cognitive power was, I haven't experienced any, any other sort of change in that sort of dramatic way. So I've been stuck sticking with it and really don't want to mess it uh, any day. And so what this is, is um, after that sort of sales pitch for it, but uh, um, it's, uh, it's called the Wim Hof Method. This is uh, Mr. Wim, uh, and he's, uh, I believe, a Norwegian guy, and he's, uh, he's they call him the Iceman. He's a little bit crazy, uh, I'd have to say. Um, he's got a couple different strategies with his whole program of cold exposure and meditation, mm. yoga, and a breathing exercise. So he's got a whole package you could sort of dive into. You know, the cold exposure is a little, a little intense for some people. So, you know, you do, do what appeals to you and what, what sort of resonates with you. So. 
what he's devised is this strategy where you do a little extra breathing for 30 repetitions and sort of you do rounds of these things. This is what all these bullet points are one round. Um, and I tend to do three rounds of this. So you start with a 30 deep breaths, which is a very full sort of top off of your lungs. It's kind of an over breath without much focus on the exhale. You just let it go. And so it's all this, you know, over breathing full lung uh, capacity with not much focus on the exhale. And that really um, starts to reduce the amount of CO2 that's in your blood. So you get that down in a very low level. So when we do the next stage, you're sort of ready and have a, a lot of tolerance built up. Um, but you're doing these sort of, um, you're also getting a sense of calm during the breathing just through your own sort of vagal nerve stimulation. And so um, then you go and move into this second phase, which is you just stop breathing. You don't hold, really hold your breath, although you are holding your breath, but you're not, don't have to really try because you've reduced your CO2 levels to such a low level that you really don't need to take a breath. And so you just wait that out until your body wants to breathe again, but it takes a while for the CO2 to start to build up. And, um, and during that time, um, and so that, you know, in the first round, maybe you reach like a minute or a minute and a half, and you'd be surprised uh, how long you go, but you could easily get into the two minutes, uh, two and a half minutes, and most people are like, you hold your breath for two minutes, and it's just not there that hard because you've taken this, this many deep breaths um, beforehand. So what this does is start to sort of offload all the oxygen that was uh, being carried on the red blood cell, and then once that sort of gets down to a very low level that it's not normally used to being at, it, um, it triggers a whole cascade of response to start to produce more red blood cells and more mitochondria because it says, hey, if we're going this low, we need to be prepared for this next time. So you're sort of tricking your body to get this sort of oxygen capacity a lot more high performing. And so, um, so you hold your breath for as long as you're comfortable with, and then you do this sort of extra step at the end, this third step, which is to take a deep breath in and hold for about 10 or 15 seconds with the lungs full of air. And um, he does a little bit of like squeeze or pressure to your head uh, to activate the pineal gland. That I think is, is, is nice and juicy and wonderful. Um, but this does, what this does is reset your CO2 and oxygen levels sort of back to normal. So you, when you're done with the third one, you don't even really need to take like a rescue breath to sort of catch your breath at all, really, that you have, might have to do in some of these other sort of fancy exercises, that, some of which we're not going to talk about. But um, so uh, you do that for about three rounds, maybe five minutes around, 15 minutes. Um, and so like we talked through some of this already, increases your white blood cell production, uh, activates your, you get this real sort of, uh, um, adrenaline dump when you uh, reach the end of that breath hold and that helps cortisol levels helps with inflammation affects your immune system this one um, as opposed to sort of calm and relaxed actually improves your energy a bit but it does give you a lot of uh, mental focus and clarity like i said uh, in my own experience and i feel that that's equally as helpful with emotional experiences that are challenging just as much as relax and calm does just depends on what your flavor is and what you sort of need to help you in your life. So there's the Wim Hof method. Um, and then uh, something that I hear Dr. Wong talk a lot about, and it's really easy to teach and to do is uh, four, seven, eight breathing um, uh, sort of popularized by Dr. Weil. And um, it's a, um, it's very simple. It's a sort of another breath count sort of thing. You do, um, you breathe in quietly through the nose for four seconds. We start with some, you know, uh, uh, empty lungs and then breathe in through the nose for four seconds, hold the breath for a count of seven, and then exhale through the mouth uh, for a count of eight. Um, I like when you do this sort of whoosh sound or you sort of purse your lips like you're blowing through a straw or make some sort of noise or humming. Humming is very soothing on the nervous system. Um, but like we explained earlier, you know, the, the exaggerated exhale is really a calming effect on on your body. And so this exaggerated exhale, that's a disproportionate amount really sort of settles you down very quickly. And so a lot of people do this to reduce anxiety you can do it, um, you know, before sleep to help you sleep. Um, he says that it helps manage cravings and uh, really can help you back down from an anger response. If you're in a situation that you've become agitated to and having a hard time controlling yourself and sort of, you know, check in on this. Um, you know, it's, um, 
Yeah, it, it can be done in the moment, seating, seated is best, but that's really simple, four, seven, eight, um, breathing. You can pull it out of your pocket anywhere you need it kind of thing. And then um, the last one that we're gonna talk about today, and then we're gonna do an example, uh, a little exercise for five minutes of this practice here, which is uh, breathing for improved uh, HRV or heart rate variability. And so um, what, if you, if, um, Sorry, just got a window popped up there. Um, if you are familiar with, um, oh my gosh, <laughs> get out of here. Sorry about that, I'm not sure if you can see that or not, but anyway, um, so heart rate variability is a, is a key determinant of health and it basically measures the heart's ability or uh, for change or your readiness and uh, for change. And so, um, you know, if you hear a heart rate in, uh, a movie or something, it's got this real, you know, even cadence of a beep, beep, beep sort of thing. Um, and so we sort of think that an even steady heart rate is the ideal state. And actually, when you, when you measure um, the heart in milliseconds, you'll see that the time between beats is all over the place, that it's actually not in the same place and that isn't steady at all. And that's actually the ideal place to be. Um, and it keeps your heart in the state of do we need to increase and be ready for something? Can we relax and stay calm? And it sort of keeps it in motion so it's ready to adapt and adjust and move to whatever's next. You know, adaptation and ability to sort of move and adjust is a, is a very healthy thing um, uh, in evolution. And so if you think of this like a, like a tennis player that's getting ready to receive a serve uh, or a ball that's, that's coming at them, they don't just stand still. They want to be ready for if it goes to the right or the left and so they stay in this sort of bouncy back and forth kind of movement which is exactly what you think of heart rate variability as it's just staying in this state of readiness and so when you have this good variability it's a it's a healthy indicator that your heart is ready and it's ready to take on whatever's next and so um this is a, a breathing strategy that basically mimics the breath uh rhythm of that um of a good heart rate variability state. And so it's, you know, it's like our other sort of hacks. If you can mimic the breath, it'll bring the other physiology, physiology along with it. And so they found that a um, six breaths a minute is, is sort of the ideal state that your lungs become in when the heart is in a great uh, level of coherence and, and heart rate variability. And so when you emulate that variability or that that lung pattern then you your heart comes along for the ride and when those two are in a sort of rhythmic pattern together we call that state uh, coherence and so it's when the lungs and the heart are are sort of in coherence and this can be bring on a real uh uh real good sense of emotional centeredness and relaxation and a real heartfelt connectedness because you're not just sort of working to breathe for a emotion but you're really pulling your heart into the sort of into the mix here and um, um, very important, especially in these, these sort of times, they've this, heard this really interesting study where they um, found that hearts put off an electromagnetic field that actually synchronizes itself with other hearts around it um, in this sort of electromagnetic uh, way. Um, and it's, it's interesting to me because I've always sort of thought through my acupuncture training and things, I've always thought of the heart more as um, as a magnet than a pump um, and you know that literally love the emotion of love is literally this sort of magnetism of the heart uh, that synchronizes with others sort of polarity so it attracts you or sort of repels you in ways and uh, and uh, think of the heart more in that sort of way so this is a really cool exercise to help with finding a level of coherence to help improve your heart rate variability and help you have the benefits of uh, of that that brings, which is uh, relaxation and sleep, some autonomic flexibility for your nervous system, emotional regulation, mental clarity, and a real deep sense of sort of calm. And so what this exercise, excuse me, um, is, is, a, um, is a six breaths a minute. And what that works out to is about five second inhale and a five second exhale. And that's all that it is. Um, do it for about five minutes, three times a day. So it takes about 15 minutes out of your day to, to really exercise your heart. And they think of this until it's a lot like, like bathing. You could do it once, but it really defeats the purpose. <laughs> you know, if you're only doing it once a week kind of thing, um, you, you need to sort of make it part of your regular routine to really get the benefits of this heart coherence and, 
and so heart rate variability um, outcome. And so some people might find that six breaths a minute isn't their ideal state and you can sort of, you know, tweak it around however you sort of what feels best because some people are in more of a six second inhale, six second exhale or a four second inhale and exhale. And so you can sort of play around with this. We're gonna do an exercise with this and I'm just gonna sort of guide you through um, uh, what an experience of this is and then we'll move on to where, where to find more resources if you guys are interested in this. So um, we're going to do a, uh, gonna put you on a beach here. So if you would like to participate in this breathing exercise, I would recommend that you are seated in your chair um, with your sort of uh, head and sit bones nice and elongated so that you could open and expand your chest and that you can get your full diaphragmatic sort of belly breathing activated here that we spoke of earlier. And as we do this, we'll sort of, I'll play a sound and it's just going to give a gong, a little, little bell gong at each five second timing. And so we'll just work through five minutes of this. At each gong, you can do the opposite of what you were just doing. If you lose track and need to restart, it's totally fine. It's no rules, it's just right uh, sort of thing. And you can take a break, you can restart. If your mind tends to wander, that's fine. Um, if, if you want to implement some other sort of mental strategies in this with a mantra or any sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, words that sort of mean something to you, you could, um, I've heard a lot of uh, people talk about like breathing in a yes and breathing out a yes or breathing in a I'm healthy and breathing out a we are all healthy. Uh, some of these sort of strategies um, can, can really add a lot to your practice uh, with your mental emotional state. So you're welcome to do any of that. Um, and I'm gonna start this off. And so it's gonna have a little sound to begin. And then as soon as you hear the gong, you'll do a five second inhale and a five second exhale. And if you need to catch up or restart, uh, all that's fine. And when it's over, I will um, give you the clue. So here we go, if everybody's sort of ready. And with this first gong, we'll start an inhale. Exhale.
Right. Got a few minutes of that. Everybody can start to come back for the presentation. And let the body start to breathe itself. It's always good to be in a sort of witnessing state of the breath and just an observation without changing it in every, any way. And so it's good to come out of your breathing exercise to just watch and see what happens to the body when it takes its own self over. And so that is a breathing exercise for heart rate variability and coherence. Um, pretty simple. We'll give you some uh, resources here on where to find some more information. You know, the great part about all this is that you have your lungs and you have this anywhere you go. You don't need a subscription. You don't need a gym. You can do it uh, during quarantine or out when it's done. Uh, and so if you want to read a book or go find some stuff online, I've got some stuff here for you. Um, I like the book, Just Breathe. It goes through all these, uh, a lot of different techniques. Um, you want to get more into heart coherence, it's a good book. Uh, from a, a Frenchman here. And then he's also got this, um, Dr. David O'Hare, um, uh, his website, Coherence Info, is more about uh, heart rate variability. And he's who I got the timing for that uh, singing bowl. And so he's got a bunch of just timed breathing. I like the timed breathing, so I use a YouTube clip or something to, to time it and just get my head out of keeping track of any of this stuff. And so, I do use a lot of this, um, the Take a Deep Breath channel on YouTube. Um, and he's got a couple, some of his old Wim Hof videos with, you know, 22 million views or whatever that um, is probably from me playing it every day. Um, so <laughs> lots of different guided exercises that you can do um, if you um, do want to use some technology. Uh, and then if not, uh, it's good to have a practice that you don't have to rely on that and take it to the beach, take it on a walk, you know, and uh, sit down in the woods, whatever you like. So we can do some uh, Q&A for a few minutes here, unless uh, Dr. Wong has anything left. Um, yeah, no, Q&A sounds good. That's great. Thank you, Corey. This is amazing. There are a few questions in the chat there. If you can turn I'm gonna stop my sharing. Here. Yeah, so if you're trying to, um, that first question there, if you're trying to get into a deep breathing, you could use the more of the, uh, a, um, uh, a, you know, a, a different cadence. This is a cadence that doesn't allow for a very sort of deep breath. It's just, uh, they found that it aligns more with the sort of heart coherence level. So it sort of emulates when your heart is in a, a maximal uh, heart rate variability state and sort of helps it get there uh, by, by emulating the, the breathing. Um, and then um, uh, I do bill for insurance. Um, we do all your billing, submit all your invoices for you. Um, I, Liz and I are both providers with Care First. And so um, uh, if you have in-network uh, benefits of that, we do that. And then if you're out of network benefits for other providers, uh, we'll bill all that on your behalf. And, and you through all navigate all that sort of um, confusing mumbo jumbo and then uh, um, nos uh, alternate nostril breathing I think it's great I've done that in a lot of yoga practices um, uh, and uh, go for it it's a very good exercise um, and then uh, the um, uh, do I do this during my acupuncture I teach I can teach it I don't really have you do a breathing exercise during a treatment it's real little probably a little much um, a lot going on during a, a acupuncture treatment with get the blood moving and, and different sort of physiological processes getting activated. And so um, I do like that people, if they have a meditation practice, they could do that during a treatment, but not a sort of active, um, uh, active breathing practice during that uh, acupuncture. I don't think I'd recommend. Um, uh, that sort of incomplete question about holding the breath. Um, um, 
you know, about uh, pre-existing conditions. Um, a lot of these techniques can help a, a pre-existing condition um, with asthma or different sort of difficulties breathing itself. Um, and so can look into a, a technique that might help you more with that condition. You know, with anything, you sort of start slow and sort of see how you respond to it. You know, you may not want to jump into some, you know, a, a Wim Hof sort of style something, practice with something easier going like this. See if you can start to sort of you know, figure yourself out and, and explore yourself and your and your boundaries and where those at before you start to graduate in the in the, uh, higher levels of things and as in anything. Um, breathing technique before meditation, I would probably um, hmm. Good question. Um, I would I like to do my Wim Hof technique and meditate during the breath holds. And then uh, afterwards I do like a box breathing with just a, a, a hold at the top and bottom and then go on into a meditation with the box breath uh, for as long as I have time for. Um, and I just ride that out uh, during my meditation uh, and it's real nice. Um, and then, um, yeah, if you have a sort of a, a blocked diaphragm, if you're feeling any sort of restrictions or impingements on your, your torso with your diaphragm or your, your rib cage, you know, there could be a situation where you have some previous, you know, injury or trauma or a scar tissue that exists in those, um, you know, some self-help techniques would be yoga to help expand those. And then, you know, if you needed to come in, see one of our myofascial release, um, sort of specialists, they could help sort of unblock some of that uh, uh, adhesions or the restrictions that you're unable to sort of do on your own. Um, and see if I've missed any other questions. I think we're over time a little bit. Corey, this is amazing. I, I feel really great after this breathing technique. Learned, learned a lot today. Breathing is really something that we we are always doing, but, but we don't always realize that, you know, we're, we're kind of on automatic pilot, but I think getting that man, getting in manually in there is, this is amazing. So, um, are you, are you, uh, are you still thinking of doing a, like a morning breath work session for, for people or, or with people? Yeah, absolutely. I was going to sort of, uh, um, invite people here. If you are interested in doing an, a, a class, um, I would, uh, you, I'm going to put my email in the chat here. Um, uh, and then um, completely able to email me and get in touch with me. We, uh, I'm thinking about setting up like a 7 a.m. practice once a week, and then we can sort of just do a, a Zoom call and sort of go through a guided breathing exercise together. I would um, participate in it with you and sort of use my morning practice just to offer it to the world. and. Um, and so we'd sort of do a practice together and it would be a recorded uh, sort of guided one that we would go along to, but we could do a little, you know, a little talk conversation about the sort of day and set the tone. Um, uh, and so it sort of, if you're interested in that, um, uh, you know, I've just put my email up there, cjeckman at cihealth.org. You can uh, message me and let me know that you're interested um, what day of the week would work for you. I'll probably think of a 7 a.m. time slot. And so, um, Anyway, um, and I, um, so if you're interested in, in that, please reach out. And, and there is something in terms of, you know, as Corey is mentioning with the breathing, you know, breathing with people like we did today, I think that's another piece of it. You know, breath work plus community is huge. You know, just, just, you know, knowing that other energetic beings are, you know, doing this and synchronizing not only their own heart and lungs and coherence, but also we're kind of, synchronizing this coherence together is, is even, you know, it's just amazing that way. So I, I know that everyone got great benefit out of this. So thank you so much, Corey, for coming on and learned so much and experienced uh, so much really deep healing here. Yeah, it's one way to help the planet, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of pain and suffering right now. And, you know, we're all yeah. breathing the same I'll need to take uh, some deep breaths and uh, yeah. <laughs> regulate the nervous system there and uh, really, really gain benefits and really help each other too. So um, thank you so much, Corey. Uh, next week, we will have Tony, who's our health coach, talk about, talk about some of the, the pitfalls and challenges and opportunities for behavior change and how she uses her own specialized way to really move the needle on behavior change for health benefits. So 
uh, really looking forward to that as well. And um, I'm going to sign up for your class, Corey, <laughs> whenever that happens at 7 a.m. Uh, it's, you know, birds already waking, waking me up, I think, too. So, you know, it's, it's and I'm, I'm doing my meditation, too, in the morning. I, I think it's great to have have a group and have a, a you know, a, a network to kind of kind of do this with and practice with. Um, yes, Insight Timer, too, is a nice, that, that's a good app, nice. Well, thank you all for your feedback. Thank you for attending during lunch hour. We know this is a valuable time for you that, you know, you're on a lot of Zoom meetings. So I really appreciate you being on this with, with uh, Corey and I today. And thank you, Jen, for preparing this uh, slides again, as usual. This is great. And um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you again next week, uh, Thursday at noon. Have a great day. Roger.